compassion. And I was able to realize, you know, my son is ill, um, and I have to figure out how to help him get well. Uh, over those 10 years, um, I learned a lot, and I also learned from so many other people about, uh, you know, at some point in the middle of this whole thing, for, you know, maybe after whatever it was, six or seven years, Nick did go to a program, and he was clean for about a year, maybe a, getting on a year and a half. Uh, and I talked to him about it, and I talked to his mom and my wife and our family um, about, you know, as a journalist, I felt, um, you know, a, 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 I was going to say a desire, but more than that, almost a, an obligation in a way to, to, to write about what had happened to us because, you know, we were like uh, so many others who have this image of what it means to be a drug addict. And again, it's not like, it doesn't look like my son. Um, uh, I thought I wanted people to know. You know, this is, um, you know, they lose, they, you know, again, it's, sort of, they, it's another cliche, but they call this an equal opportunity affliction. And I learned that it, it is, um, and everyone's vulnerable to it, and I wanted other people to know. And it was, um, I also, this was also a time of, uh, of uh, you know, crystal meth. People didn't know about crystal meth. It was, now everybody does, but it was not the drug that we had been taught about, that we had been warned about. I mean, it wasn't heroin or crack or any of the other drugs. It was sort of a drug that was isolated in you know, sort of rural areas in the middle of the country, but by then it became, it's just hit San Francisco. And of course, you know, Nick was right at the cutting edge of everything, and one of them was, <laughs> was, was discovering crystal meth and, you know, as he was, a, you know, he was 18 or 19. Um, and so I learned by then you know, how toxic this particular drug is and how, um, you know, how, how difficult you know, it is to treat. Um, so anyway, I, have, I felt this need to write about it, and I did, and I wrote an article that was in the Times, the New York Times Magazine. Um, and based on that, uh, there, I, I, been out, I went forward to write the, the, the full story as much as I could in, in the book that became Beautiful Boy. Um, and that's when uh, everything changed again in my life. Uh, about 10 years of hell um, uh, was, you know, everything changed then. That was only about trying to get Nick um, to save his life. Um, but then everything changed again, and that was because when the article in the book came out, um, a door opened, uh, and it was open, it opened to a world that I've had glimpses existed from all of the treatment programs that you know, I've been to, and by then, you know, my wife and I were going to Al-Anon meetings, and I knew that there were these sort of hidden groups of people that were affected by this disease, but it was this hidden small group of people, these people that would show up in these rooms in Al-Anon, or people, you know, family groups, and, treatment centers. Um, but when the book came out, uh, the flood of you know, letters and emails, and there was a chat room online and a conversation there, and phone calls that I got from people who got my phone number, uh, <laughs> over and over and over again, you know, I heard from people who were, you know, themselves in the throes and suffering in the same way that I had suffered and um, everyone felt, every, so many people expressed the same thing, but you know, I thought I was alone. Uh, and they said, you know, when I read your story, I thought, how did you get into our house? Uh, <laughs> the details were different, but you know, this is what happened to us and you know, there have been, I mean, I heard from people who were themselves addicted and who sort of felt suddenly that they were able to kind of a little bit at least connect to their parents with their families had been through. But mostly I heard from parents and it was, they were, they were like me, they were, they were in hell and they were suffering alone, um, you know, because this disease uh, doesn't just come with all this horrible behavior and it doesn't even all come with these sleepless nights and this pain. Uh, it also comes with um, shame and stigma. Uh, and so we keep it quiet. And so we might not know that the person you know, sitting next to us in the next cubicle, or even or our next door neighbor, uh, or our next door neighbor's child, we don't know because we always are making excuses and we're hiding it. Um, I heard it over and over again. I thought I was alone. 
Um, and the other thing I heard over and over and over again was that you know when we were when this was happening to us, I could not imagine that I could ever say this. Uh, things were so terrible that I could not ever imagine saying that after everything that we'd been through from these people that I met and the letters I received, uh, I realized that we were the lucky ones. Um, we were the lucky ones because so many people told me that, you know, our, our, our family story is your family story, except we had a different conclusion. You know, my beautiful boy didn't make it. Uh, my lovely daughter uh, died. It was, it, 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 you know, I, I, it was overwhelming. I mean, it was overwhelming, and I, I, um, I just was so. It just was so overwhelming. I, I just, what was going on? That here is this problem that you know suddenly there's this flood of people, and I'm starting to understand that these are people, every kind of person, so every socioeconomic group, everywhere in the country. There was no place that this isn't happening, and yet people are. Not talking about it, they're suffering in silence. They are, you know, they're, they're people are going through, you know, these, you know, ten years or twenty years, or in some case longer, thirty years, forty years, lifetimes of hell, and then so many people are losing someone they love. Um, what is going on? Um, something is terribly wrong. Uh, and. Uh, I was at that point, I thought after Beautiful Boy, my plan was to go back to my other work as a journalist and um, you know, write this book I was thinking about, about architecture. And, um, you know, I, suddenly that didn't seem as, as compelling or as important uh, as, as trying to understand you know, what we are dealing with. Um, so I, I set off to, um, to learn as much as I could about prediction. What is it? Why is it so hard to treat? Is it treatable? Um, why don't we talk about it? Um, and I spent, you know, basically the next, I mean, you know, the last, you know, the last year until until um, this year, writing you know, my, my new book, Clean, and it was um, all about trying to understand, you know, what's going wrong, what's gone wrong, and what can we do? Can we do anything? Uh, and I guess one of the main thing I learned, or the main thing I ended up feeling after this experience, or all these years over time, was that um, I guess I was I went into this and I learned about the horrors that you know I didn't need to be told, um, but I learned about the enormity of the problem. You know, not just from the people I met, which of course was the most hard to deal with, but also the most powerful uh, uh, reminder every day about how many people are. With and, and, and just the pain, but I also learned about the numbers. I learned that you know that we are losing 350 people every day. You know, in 15 minutes, uh, 19 people. Um, you know, just in an hour, whatever, you know, 80. Um, um, there are 20 million people who are addicted. Uh, directly connected to those 20 people, 100 million people. In their families, um, but I also learned that you know that even people who you know, uh, everyone is affected. Um, you know, it's it's you know addiction is related to uh, almost every other problem you can name. You know, the new book I, I my subtitle uh, is "Overcoming Addiction and Ending America's Greatest Tragedy," and many people have said to me, um, you know, in interviews or whatever, they say, you know. Okay, overcoming addiction is a problem, but America's greatest tragedy. Uh, but first of all, this is the number one killer in America that is not, you know, cancer or heart disease. So it's the number one non-natural killer, um, mostly now related to uh, prescription pill misuse and sometimes the connection about heroin and other opiates. Um, it's uh, it's you know 120 thousand people. Um, a year, I think it's actually more than that now. Um, and but the other piece is that is that you know we are in an economic crisis and we're losing what 
and we've calculated to be $420 billion a year we're spending on addiction related problems, which include uh, you know, the healthcare costs, the criminal justice costs, the lost productivity costs. You know, my, my um, sister-in-law is a nurse in, in a hospital in San Francisco, and she said that about 80% of the people that come into their emergency room, 80%, are, uh, are there because of drugs and alcohol. Um, and she said, you know, the biggest crime of that, the biggest shame of that, is these people come in because they have an infection or they've broken something or whatever it is, and they, they come into the emergency room and they do their best to patch them up, and then they send them out. And then they're back in three weeks. You know, we call them frequent flyers. And she said, you know, she calculated for me one patient's, you know, she went through their charts and calculated that on one patient, one patient over a period of a little more than a year, uh, the charges were a million dollars. And we're talking about a healthcare crisis that we have, and we're talking about, and then what about crime? You know, we know about the impact of crime. I mean, sheriffs uh, around the country I talked to, uh, uh, police have talked to, in some places, you know, where, where a drug like methamphetamine has swept the country, they say, you know, 90%, even more, of the crime they deal with is related to meth or, or other, you know, it's, so we're filling up our prisons, we have more prisons, prisoners in America than anybody, anywhere else in the world, you know, we think we're so, you know, advanced, progressive, but, you know, way more than China, <coughs> Russia, number one, and most of the people in the criminal justice system are there because of drugs and alcohol. Uh, so I learned about the enormity of the problem um, and the pain that it causes, the suffering that is incalculable and undescribable, again, unless you, unless you know it personally. Um, but, the, but if that's all I learned, I would have been you know, devastated uh, to acknowledge that we have this problem, this, 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 you know, this plague uh, in America. And, um, and resigned, and just said that this is you know, affecting so many of us and so many of our loved ones, so many of our children. But that isn't just what I learned. Um, I came to find out, I came to learn that, you know, that addiction is a preventable problem that we don't prevent. And it's a treatable problem that we don't treat. And so my sort of resignation, my acceptance changed. Um, and it turned to rage. And it turned to this, this rage that I feel from every person who's had someone in their life afflicted with this disease and who has tried and tried and tried to help them and to get them help and has you know, met the same you know, roadblocks as me. There was no path to follow. Um, on one hand, we're told that addiction is a disease, but you know we know how to treat diseases. At least we know how to proceed. If someone we love, you know, has signs of early signs of cancer or heart disease or anything, we know what to do. You know, we call a doctor. We go to the best doctor that we can find, um, and we bring them to the doctor, and they, you know, we get them assessed, and they tell us, you know, maybe there's not a problem, but to pay attention, see how things go, or they assess a, you know, a very early problem and treat. It if they can, or else they you know, order tests and they send us to a specialist or whatever it is. But with addiction, um, you know, we're left to you know the internet, where you go online and and, and you know, programs will tell you uh, you know we have a hundred percent success rate. Um, where they'll tell you that we you know, treat you know, dual diagnosis, and you know dual diagnosis is meaning, you, know, you know you know it means it's you know, co-occurring disorders, addiction with something else like Nick has addiction with bipolar disorder. We treat that. And then when you, were, you know, when I, as a journalist, investigated that, you know, they, these patients never ever saw um, a, a doctor, a psychiatrist who could have been identified and treated the fact, you know, the, the co-occurring disorder. So, you know, um, uh, so so there was this this incredible anger about, you know, why, you know, why, why are we not talking about this? Why are we not? Uh, effectively stopping, you know, we know that most people start who have drug problems, uh, you know, almost all of them start when they're teenagers. Um, why are we so ineffective, you know, stopping, preventing, you know, uh, drug use? Um, and then when people become addicted, why are we so uh, ineffective uh, trying, you know, to, to, to treat them? Um, and so there was this sadness and there was sort of, you know, this anger. Um, but the other thing I found, um, were around the, um, you know, sort of in corners that I would find uh, 
uh, and I found them more and more when I started to know how to look. And these were these places of light, of hope, um, of, of a reason to have you know, realistic optimism that things can change. Um, they were places you know, where there were researchers who were making breakthroughs in understanding the mechanics of addiction and based on them coming up with treatments that actually work, and that have been shown to work. Um, I found you know, doctors, therapists, social workers, you know, nurses, people devoted their lives to helping people who suffer this affliction and supporting their families. I found hope in, um, uh, there's a, a new organization being founded um, you know, this is the third largest killer in America, and yet they're, you know, the American Heart Association helps, you know, everything that they, they help support research, they help, you know, lobby for policy. The American Cancer Society does the same. You know, the reason that there are warnings on cigarette packages are, are you know, is because of the lobbying by the American Cancer Society. Um, they've supported research, they, um, uh, they've educated the public, you know, they've had the, anyway, there's, this is the third largest killer in America, and where is the organization to help us, guide us? You know, we want to do something. What do we do? Um, so now, you know, this man who, it's an uh, incredible man named, named uh, Aaron Mandel. Anyway, he's this great man whose um, story is, you know, like, at least begins like mine. He spent 10 years trying to do everything he could to save his uh, son. And then after that 10 years, um, about two miles from where we sit right now, uh, his son killed himself. Uh, and he was ready to kill himself too after losing his son. Uh, and the reason he's alive now, the only reason he's alive, is because he finally determined um, that he will spend every moment of his life, the rest of his life, trying to save other people from going through what he's been through. So he is creating uh, in a very sophisticated way that makes me really feel like he's going to pull it off. Basically, what uh, they, don't, they don't have a name yet, but it's going to be something like the American Addiction Society. Um, thank God. Um, and there are, you know, there's hope uh, in the stories that I've heard from people who tell me um, that they were able to find treatment that helped them. And sometimes it took them a long time to find it, and it took them multiple uh, trials, multiple failures, uh, but I heard from people who either wrote me or came to events like this and afterwards, you know, told me that they were in recovery and they made it, you know, sometimes it was, you know, three days, sometimes it was a, a month, you know, sometimes it was six months, and then there were people who made it, you know, a year, two years, five years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, uh, and they'd been to a place like, I heard, from people, you know, finally, I went to this place in Pasadena, um, and I've been sober since then. Um, there's light, there's hope. Um, and the reason, the other reason there's hope, let's stop talking um, and have time for a conversation about this, but the other reason that there's hope is that when I travel, when I meet people, more and more when I hear from them, there is, they, people everywhere also have come to where I have come to. Um, rage, uh, anger. Um, we will no longer tolerate a disease, the existence of a disease that we don't talk about. As a, as, a, as a nation. Um, there is a movement of people who are saying, you know, I lived in San Francisco, near San Francisco, and I lived in the middle of you know, the Castro District in San Francisco in the early 80s when AIDS sort of swept through that community and killed, you know, come two of my dearest friends. Um, and at first, you know, there were similarities. You know, there was a stigma around AIDS, and there was, you know, sort of this, talk about it. There were very few options for treatment, but you know, this movement 
uh, this powerful, profound movement came in and changed everything. And it was about people who said, you know, I will no longer accept this. We are going to change this. They had a, a slogan, you know, silence equals death. Uh, well, silence equals death with addiction too, and we can no longer stay silent. This can no longer stay hidden in the shadows, and it won't. Uh, we will not allow that. People in this room will no longer allow that. Uh, I'd love to hear, you know, what anyone has to say, answer any questions. So, uh, before that, I just want to thank you again for allowing me to be here. And to the again. Um, he relapsed uh, again. Uh, he said that you know, after being clean for whatever it was, I don't know if it was a year and a half, uh, he was in a, somebody's house, kind of stressed out, you know, in a social situation. It's not his favorite thing to be. And, uh, and he went to the bathroom. And um, a habit of his from, you know, the old, <laughs> I guess it's something addicts may need to do sometimes. Because uh, he opened up the medicine cabinet and there was a bottle of vitamin in and he said, oh, that will help me deal with this situation and he took one. And then he left and of course he went back and eventually he took the bottle. And, um, but, he made, but, but what happened was the next morning, uh, actually it wasn't exactly the next morning, but very soon in the, in the, in the morning, um, he said to me, I cannot believe what I'm doing. And he told me, and he himself, without any intervention from me, without any sort of pressure, without any threats from you know, anyone, the police or anything, um, he picked up the phone uh, and he uh, got himself in a program and he got on a plane and he went into treatment and he's been sober since then now for five years. Um, and if anybody, you know, I meet, you know, again, these people who are just beside themselves and um, there's almost no one I meet who used more drugs and did more sort of crazy, dangerous combinations of them. Uh, that's, I mean, there, it's, almost, it's almost impossible. I mean, you know, if you read his book, you can see that. He it was just, just as far as it goes. And the fact that he's clean, the fact that he is, um, he's not only you know, clean, he's like this miracle person. You know, he's, this, he's my beautiful body. He's as close as ever, repairing over a lot of time, repairing all of our relationships. Daisy and Jasper are, you know, they're so close, and he's their you know, big brother, their role model. He comes down, they come down, he lives here. Uh, they come down and spend time with him. Um, and he's, you know, he got married last summer. Uh, and the big miracle is that uh, yeah, there was a time when I, I was sure, it wasn't that I, I was worried, I, I was certain he was not going to make it until 21. And you know, this summer he turned 30. So it's mm -hmm. amazing. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. I um, am a recovering alcoholic myself, um, but I had a sister, I still have a sister, but at 14 she started doing drugs, and for 30 years I went through, and my mom who was baby, went through the pain that you talked about, where are they? I mean, you know, going to work drugs, and she's kidnapped with guns, where they have to go, I mean, just horrible things that you think of this beautiful little kid, how does this happen? And so my struggle was, I would drink over her heroin use, and then I go, well, you know, at least it's not illegal, it's you know, whatever I'm telling myself. And because my father was an alcoholic, I did not want to be an alcoholic, but my sister's a drug addict, that's worse. <coughs> um, 20 rehabs later, and I'm having to report, she's five years sober, she had a kid during this um, uh, span, but my mother would sweep it under the placemat. Don't talk about Liz to other people. I mean, we could be somewhere, but you'd fall in food. I mean, 
you know, not out in for food. And I said, Mom, people know this. You've got to face up to it. And I'm so excited to hear about bringing the conversation to an open forum so all of us that suffer with watching someone slowly die can get some comfort and help find some answers to how to, you know, talk about this and help the other addicts. Thank you so much for your talk. Well, thank you. I, I don't know if you can hear in the background, back, but um, it's just so sad that people, I hear the same story um, about, you know, the mother whose child is, you know, passing out at the dinner table and yet, you know, so don't talk about, you know, this problem um, over and over again. And, you know, I understand it, you know, we all, I think, probably understand it because you know, it is the shame. I mean, for me, it was like, what does it mean about me that my son is a drug addict? That must be a terrible thought. Um, I didn't want people to judge Nick. Um, and so I kept it a secret, too. Uh, even my best friends didn't know for a while. Um, but openness is such a relief. You know, uh, I loathe the idea, resisted the idea of going to Al-Anon meetings for such a long time. Uh, everybody, of course, said, go to Al-Anon, go to Al-Anon, go to Al-Anon. Like, you know, I am not one of those people. I'm not into groups and touchy feelings, sort of, you know, sitting around sharing. And uh, I just, you know, I just, it, anyway, finally, you know, when things were bad enough, of course, I, as a measure of how bad it was, I, I was desperate for any help. And so I went to a meeting and instantly, you know, there was this, oh, I am not alone. It didn't solve the problem, but I realized I wasn't alone. I had, I, I learned from other people's stories. Uh